And I'm NECA. I'm also an MS4 at McGovern Medical School in Houston, Texas. Um, Caroline, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Caroline. Um, I'm an MD PhD um, candidate at the University of Miami. I'm in my second year of my PhD, so I've done two years of med school and I'm in the second year of my PhD. I'm also a Simmons alum, so nice to see everybody. Nice. And last but not least, Rupi. Yep, my name is Zitsvi. I am a third year medical student at University of New England, which is an osteopathic school in Maine. Um, I'm also a Simmons alum. I majored in neuroscience and behavior while so I was there. So thank you for introducing yourselves. Um, I have a set of questions, um, a lot of questions actually to ask, um, but anyone else feel free to um, interrupt and ask questions as well. And uh, this will be going on for an hour. So yeah, um, I'll begin. So my first question is, why did you choose your specific program? So whether that be MD, DO or MD, PhD, anyone can start answering. So um, I chose McGovern because one, it was home. I'm from Houston originally, so I felt like it was going to be where I was family. And then once I got to the interview, um, I felt like they were genuinely happy to be there. Um, they had a diverse population of students that were ambassadors that really showcased um, really positive aspects of the school. And I felt like if I was going to be in a place where I knew where medical school was going to be very difficult for me, I wanted to be close to family, but also at a place that felt supportive to their current students. And so I knew that I would be adequately trained at McGovern Medical School. And so far it's been like that, <laughs> to make the right decision, so yeah. Mine are like similar week reasons. When I came for my interview at McGovern, like you can just feel that everybody there like was supportive. It was like a big community. Everybody was super friendly and really genuine. And like, you really didn't get that competitive aspect there when you're there. And then I chose MD specifically. I honestly never really thought about another path. I never thought about like PA. I never thought about getting a PhD because I love science, but not that much. <laughs> I was like, four years is enough for me. Shout out to you, girl, because <laughs> I could not do it. But I knew that wasn't the path for me. Like MD was enough. I thought about like doing MPH here and there, but honestly, I'm tired. So <laughs> like MD is good enough for me. But depending on like what you're interested in, yeah. of course, like they have those options for you. So. So to piggyback off of that, yes, it, it is a long time, but definitely not for everybody. Um, and I hope I'm jealous all my, my med school class right now is fourth year. So they just submitted their ERAS applications, which I'm hopefully you guys have like totally done with that. Um, that's exciting. So yeah, now I'm in like the low part where it's like, wow, all my friends are graduating. I could be done, but I'm not, but that's okay. Um, so when I started at Simmons, I thought that I wanted to do, um, well, I knew that I wanted to do medicine and I never considered, I didn't even know about an MD PhD till my senior year. I was doing research with Dr. Gray. Um, I also majored in neuroscience. So I was doing neuroscience research and was like, wow, I really like this. Was doing my thesis project, was like, hmm, I could see myself doing research, found out about MD PhD programs and then decided that I should figure out if I really liked research before I committed eight years of my life. So then I worked as a, a research tech at Dana-Farber for two years. During that time, I took the MCAT, applied to medical school and MD-PhD programs. I applied to both medical school programs and also MD-PhD programs. Sometimes applications overlap, sometimes they don't. Um, but yeah, that's how I ended up in an MD-PhD program. Yeah, so I, to be honest, applied to both MD and DO programs. And I'm sure a lot of you are wondering why I chose one path versus the other. And for me, I actually mainly applied in the New England area because being close to home was a, like really important to me to be near my family. Um, and, but I obviously looked into like, what is the difference and why would I even want to go into DO if that's what I ended up doing. And I think honestly, at the end of the day, my goal is like, I want to be, I want to be a physician and I could accomplish that either way. So whatever is best for me and my family, that would work out. Um, being a DO, I looked into it a little bit. I'm like, and I don't think I actually really understood it until I was there, to be honest. Like, you know, it's like, oh yeah, like they do OMM, you can do the same training, but there's this additional 200 hours of clinical training. And I think the one 
benefit that I did like was that you really, really focus on anatomy to like a deeper level. I think a lot of medical schools, you have anatomy for, let's say like six months and then you do neuroanatomy. And our school, we do a full year of anatomy and then we do neuroanatomy for six months, for six weeks um, during our second year. So we focus on anatomy a little bit more and that kind of helps us with the manipulative treatment that we learned. And honestly, I think that's just like, you can kind of specialize in it and go that route, or you can as, just use it as like an additional tool in terms of whatever specialty you, you go into. And I just, I always thought it was a really nice additional tool to have, you know, like you think about like in this country, like the opioid issue is like such a big deal. And, you know, people kind of focus on medicine and treating through medicine and having this additional tool is like, is really helpful. And I think just learning that was really important for me. Um, obviously if a patient comes in with like a UTI, you're going to treat them with medicine, but you know, if a patient has like pretty severe chronic, like chronic back pain, you can use this manipulative treatment, which is helpful. And I think learning that was a big deal for me, which is why I did like this route that I did choose. Thank you. Um, my next question kind of deals with what you were saying about um, OMM um, being applied in any specialty. Do you guys have any specialties you're interested in? Or I know we have some fourth years, what specialty are you going in? So yeah. Yeah, so we actually submitted our ERS like recently. Um, I'm going into ob and I'm doing anesthesiology. So, yeah. <laughs> nice, nice. Congratulations. That's so exciting. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> so I have more time to decide another approximately four years, but I'm considering pediatrics. I don't really want to make a complete decision until I do my third year, fourth year rotations to see if I still actually like treating children. Um, but so thinking about peds, and then I'm currently doing oncology research. So maybe focusing on um, medical oncology, hematology. So congratulations to you guys as well. Um, those are awesome fields. I've been exposed to a little bit during my third year rotations, but not entirely yet. Um, so I'm just starting my third year, so I haven't been exposed to everything just yet. I'm a little bit more interested in pediatric neurology or um, pediatric developmental medicine. I just know I don't want to do adults. I like pediatrics. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I'm interested in right now. Nice. Thank you for sharing that. Um, the next question I have, and again, anyone else is welcome to have questions because I have a lot. <laughs> Uh, this is more for the chocolate docs. Uh, what got you into starting a YouTube channel? How has it been? <laughs> Next question. <laughs> question. <laughs> so um, we actually met in, in uh, med medical school, school yeah. and I felt like there needed to be more presentation as far as medical YouTube world. I didn't really have that representation. I didn't really have a lot of mentors, like the whole, my whole pre-med journey. Um, so doing this, like you guys attending this is really dope because I didn't have as much this when I was in college. Um, but I felt like we both were passionate about mentorship from the, from the jump and we clicked as friends first. And so I felt like that would be a good dynamic to have on camera, but also as far as like organically giving genuine advice and being real and honest about our journey, because I think sometimes when you see influencers, not that we are, but like people who have a platform, they tend to like filter what they share. And medical school is hard, but it also has its, you know, high points too. And we wanted to share both sides and we didn't feel like we saw that a lot um, on social media. So we wanted to do that for the next generation of physicians. Yeah. Thank you. I personally watch all of your videos. Like, YouTube, so. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> I was so excited when you agreed to come in. <laughs> Um, so opening it up to the whole panel again, uh, what advice would you give to current pre-med students? So one thing I would say, so I was actually an interviewer for my school last year. I was one of the student interviewers and 
I saw this a lot. I think one of the biggest advice I would have is try not to just check off the boxes. Um, I think as an interviewer, I really want to see how how you were as a person, not necessarily like just like what you're going to be as a student. Like, how am I going to work with you as a colleague? Like, if I if you're only doing things for the sake of checking out boxes, like you're only doing volunteering in hospitals, you're only doing medical research, but you're not doing necessarily anything outside of that that will help me know what you are as a person. I don't, I. I'm not necessarily understanding how you are as a person, how you're going to be as a colleague to me. Like, I want to see if you're going to be a team player. I want to see if you're a leader in not just medical clubs, but also other things, and if you're well-rounded. Yeah, definitely. Just to kind of like piggyback off of that, I would just say just be yourself. I feel like going through this process, like we compare ourselves, we like look at other people's journey, try to see what they're doing. We think we have to like be this certain type of person to be a medical student. But honestly, I feel like just being yourself goes so far. Like us with our interviews coming up, we've been getting the same advice. Like just be yourself, just be genuine. And that's going to like come across and shine mm -hmm. through during your interviews. And that's what the interviewers want to see. They just want to see somebody being themselves, being personable, being you know being able to talk to people and hold a conversation and share what you're passionate about even if it's not medical related so that would be my biggest piece of advice I agree I also agree I think having just being able to write about and talk about things that you're actually passionate about whether it's medically related or not re medically related is uh, super important especially now I feel like I don't have admissions experience, but I think that med schools are starting to take a more holistic view at all of their applicants. So if all of your stuff is in medicine, but like you really have another passion, like it's good to focus on everything and make sure you talk about everything in your application and don't leave out stuff that you think is not medically relevant because if it's part of what you're interested in and what you like to do, then it's important to the admissions committee because they're really just trying to figure out if you're a right fit for their program. Yeah, and going off of that, like, I have to say, I think at my medical school interviews, like, more people asked about, like, the dance team that I was on versus, like, the volunteering experience that I had. Like, they're going to care a lot more about those little things that you do. Um, and another thing is something, like, you don't really talk about, but don't be so hard on yourself. <laughs> like, I feel like as a pre-med, you're just being told to do so many things that you're required to take X amount of classes, do X amount of hours of research, and just understand that you're trying like the best that you can and people will see that and people will see your hard work. <laughs> she wants uh, to say something now. <laughs> <laughs> I had to think about it. Um, ask for help early. Like y'all look young, like y'all look real young. <laughs> so ask for help very early. Like if you are struggling in a class, go to the professor's office hours. I mean, obviously it's COVID child, but go to Zoom meeting, with, find a phone call, call them up if they have their office hour numbers on there because not only does it help you, but you also get like to get FaceTime with the professors. Um, if they have tutoring services at my college, I didn't find out about tutoring services until like I was a junior in college and most of it was free. So go to those things because they are there to help you. And you're probably paying for it in your tuition. So you might as well just utilize that because um, they still have those resources in medical school. And you don't know that unless you look for it. Um, and hopefully you guys have admission, or not admissions, but like a pre-med office that really is helpful to you. But if not, try to seek out people who are also pre-med, but are a year above you because then they can help you with picking out which professors you need to avoid or take, which classes you need to take and all those things. Sometimes your advisors are not that great. And so you might find like little big maps from people who've already been through that whole, whole experience at your specific school. Um, Chiara, I was hoping I could ask a question. Go ahead. So this is up for the panel, but how difficult was it for you to adjust to your first year of med school and was it like ever so tough to the point where you're like, why am I even doing this? And how did you get through it? <laughs> so I guess it's like a three-parter. <laughs> yes to all of that. <laughs> it was rough. <laughs> 
I feel like, I don't know, during like college, undergrad was, it was difficult. Like some classes are harder than others. Like some classes are pretty easy, but I feel like the biggest thing with med school is like people will like joke around and say, it's like you're drinking from a fire hydrant, but literally it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. Like there's so much information and it's not that the information is hard. It's just a lot. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have good study habits, if you never really learned how to study and like learned how you best like acquire information and retain information, then it can be really hard in the beginning. Cause I feel like that's what I struggled with the most. I really didn't have good study habits. Um, I guess I was just kind of blessed to, to like do well without having to try too hard. But like in med school, I had to try very hard. Mm -hmm. And so I had to really figure out like, how do I best study? Mm -hmm. Do I need to read? Do I need to do questions? Do I need to watch videos? And then also we have so many people giving us resources and it's like, you don't know what resource is gonna like be the best for you. And so I was just trying to like try all these different things but nothing was really sticking. Um, so that was definitely like a huge learning curve for me. But of course, like you learn and adjust. you get better, you adjust, you grow, you realize mm -hmm. how far <laughs> you have come from the yeah. very beginning. And I mean, you just kind of get through it. Like, I don't really have any advice on how to get through it. You just kind of do it. And yeah. then you look back and you're like, oh, I did that. Yeah. So Because college was its own adjustment, but you, got, you guys are all like figuring it out as you go. And that's pretty much what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. um, and just to add on to what she was saying, I'm blanking right now. But I think making sure that you have your support system around you and finding people in medical school, even in college, but finding people in medical school who are like-minded a little bit so that you don't feel alone. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you would feel like, oh, am I the only one going through this? And then your friends are like, yeah, girl, me too. I'm, I'm struggling in this course. And you're like, okay, I'm not alone. I'm not crazy. I'm not stupid. It's just hard. like, this is just hard for everybody. So that's just important to know. I agree. I think you have to find your your group and of support system, whether it be a few friends or whoever, like in your cohort, because everyone is going through the same thing. Um, I'm just echoing what everyone else has said. Like I totally agree. And one thing that I would recommend is if you haven't, if you have something that relaxes you that you like to do, like for me, I like to go running. Um, and I was like, I will sacrifice an hour a day to get in my workout because if I don't, it was it was not gonna go well. When I was working, I was working full time and studying for the MCAT, and I completely stopped exercising and doing anything fun besides work and study, and I was absolutely miserable. And you have to remember, like once you are in medical school, you deserve to be there. You have earned this spot, and if you don't, if you lose a couple points on a test because you need to take care of yourself, then that's totally fine. Like a lot of medical schools are pass fail anyway. It's more about learning the material and you really need to focus on you sometimes. So I think learning self-care early on is super important and making sure you incorporate that into your first year of medical school. Cause you will get into the, oh my goodness, I have to study, I have to do this, but just taking a step back and like, no, I need to take care of myself first. That's something really important that you need to learn quick. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with everything that everyone has said. I think when you asked that question, we all kind of laughed because we all have this shared experience of like, yeah, it kind of sucked, you know, <laughs> especially like your first two years of med school. Um, it's very difficult. And I think the hardest part for me is like recognizing and also being okay with the fact that your study habits are going to change every single year of med school. Like every year is a little bit different and you have to adjust to that. And and you're going to be able to do it. Like initially you're like, oh my God, I can't do this, but you will be able to do with it. So you'll be able to do it. And like your support system is going to be, play a big role in that. Um, also finding like your mentor, like the way we talked about finding someone in the year above you in college, I felt the same way about med school finding like you're like, I'm a third year now, so I'm asking fourth years, what do I do in third year to succeed on my rotations? And that will really, really help you throughout your life is finding a good mentor, whether it's just friends or like even like your peers who are next to you who have been on like a rotation before you, like that's going to play a big role. And like everyone said, you know, take care of yourself. It's, it's in the long run, it will, it will really, really help you. And I'm saying this as I just finished my medical board this year, like in the middle of COVID, um, it was really tough, but I had people who were helping me out. I had a support system and I was also doing my best. I was spending an hour working out every day because I was like, I need to do this so that I can get through this 16 hour day of studying, you know? 16 hours is a lot of study. <laughs> 
Uh, I guess that brings me to my next question. How do you guys balance your time um, with family, extracurriculars, if you do that, um, academics, and just me time? I would just say like time management. I have my like priority list. This is what needs to happen now. This is what can happen later. And this is what can wait. And then also adding in seeing friends um, and family. And just to highlight, I'm from Massachusetts, um, have never lived anywhere but Massachusetts, came down to Miami. Um, and I do definitely miss having my family around, but it is a good growing experience. Like if you're options are not necessarily close to home. You can create your own support network, um, which I had to do because I have, don't know anyone in Florida. Um, but yeah, I think balancing time with family and friends is really important. But yeah, just like like you do in college, like you have your classes, you're balancing your, your studying with your work and whatnot. But I think you just, you kind of find your, you find your balance. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I'm going to be honest, I'm one of those people who likes to plan and make a schedule for every day. I need to watch this every day. And like, you know, I just watch these videos to, for the next day and such. But also, I'm like, I feel like I have to be okay with adjusting that schedule a little bit so that I can make some me time. Like, it's okay to watch this video for school tomorrow so that I can hang out with some friends today. Um, so just being a little bit flexible with yourself and understanding that it's okay to get a little bit behind, but then also keep pushing forward. Um, yeah, I think just prioritizing it. I think for the way we were able to still go to brunch and all these pre-COVID, obviously, but you know, just have fun. I think we prioritize it. We knew that we didn't want to make medical school our whole world, so we didn't. We treated it as a job, essentially. Like, of course, there were days where we were like studying all day, but I think we were we came into medical school knowing ourselves and knowing who we are, and like having friends that's outside of medical school in our family who kind of doesn't really understand all the <laughs> all the stresses in medical school. So it was just like, I know that I need to see them so I can be sane. Mm -hmm. Sometimes talking about medical school 24 seven, it's- <laughs> It will drive you crazy. It will drive you crazy. So yeah, just probably keeping that as a priority was what helped me not go crazy during medical school. You definitely have time for the things that are important for you. So when I hear people in medical school be like, you don't have time for this, you don't have time for that. Well, if it's important for, to you, then you're gonna make time for it. Mm -hmm. So like, you definitely have time. You just have to use your time wisely and effectively, mm -hmm. but you definitely have time to live your life. <laughs> uh, speaking about time, um, I know that a lot of us are in extracurriculars. Um, what extracurriculars did you guys do during undergrad and are you doing any during medical school if there's time for that <laughs> extracurriculars in undergrad oh that was a while ago um, <laughs> but I like love volunteering so I always was a part of like community service organizations I was like a chair of one of the organizations and I like planned community service events I volunteered at, like Ronald McDonald House I did some volunteering in hospitals um, I was a mentor in multiple organizations um, and then I did research a little bit as well um, so that was, and then I worked, I, I had to work because mm -hmm. I, I like to make money. So I worked on campus and then I had an off-campus job too that I worked like part-time a few hours a week. Mm -hmm. So I was busy during undergrad. You don't have as much time to do a lot of extracurriculars and to work during med school. But again, I continued my volunteering and my service. Mm -hmm. And then of course our YouTube channel is an extracurricular activity. Um, and then mentorship, of course, we did a lot of outreach things, a lot of panels like this mm -hmm. um, throughout med school. Our school hosted things. We were student ambassadors for our school. She interviews uh, students right now. So like there's ways that you can get involved and there's a lot of opportunities for that. Yeah, for sure. Ruby, you can go ahead. <laughs> um, so similarly, I think in undergrad, I did, you know, I did lots of volunteering, like whether it was in hospitals or like the homeless shelters nearby. Um, I just, it was really important to me to kind of work with those communities. So I tried to prioritize that, but also I did work in research, obviously the pre-med club or pre-health club. Um, and then I also did things like SGA and class council because that was a little bit separate from medicine. So it was kind of fun to get involved in some of those activities. Um, like they said, like in med school, I think you have a little bit less time to do those extracurricular activities, but you can find time. Like for example, over the summer, I did some research in developmental medicine. Um, 
I was involved in the interviewing here. And then I'm trying to think, also like volunteering, like I was part of a needle exchange program. So there's definitely times you can get involved, but you obviously have to prioritize your education a little bit more when you're in med school. So when I was at Simmons, I was on the cross country team. Um, so that took up a lot of time, but running, I like to run. So it was a good stress relief in social aspect too. Um, I was involved um, as an orientation leader in other leadership positions on campus. And then I was really involved in Circle K. I don't know if Circle K is still there. It's a community service club. Um, so we just did different events around Boston. Still there? Yay, okay, good. Because <laughs> my, my, the student above me, she started that club. So happy to hear that it's still going. So I was really, really, really involved in Circle K at, on the club level and on the district level. Um, and then in med school, um, agree that it's very busy, um, but you find time for things you like to do. And I would say a lot of the student clubs are very adaptable to like medical student schedules. You have to remember that you're all medical students. Everyone has basically the same schedule. You're super busy. So there's so many different like lunch meetings and evening meetings that all of them involve food. That's how you get students to go because that's where the food is. Um, yes, and then our, uh, med school does runs community health fairs um, during the year. So that's a great way to get involved and like know your local community and a lot of things like you can be as committed or as not committed as you want to be. And it just depends on what you're interested in and what your schedule's like. If you're really passionate about something, like I was volunteering, we have a preschool on campus. So I was working with the kids one day a week um, for med, uh, MS1 and 2, just because I love working with kids, but also like with the interest groups, they have interest groups for each specialty. You can just pop in and out of those. They don't expect you to go to every single event they have. So I would just keep in mind that a lot of the med school stuff is very flexible. Um, because you all have super busy schedules. Thank you. Um, my next question is, how has COVID impacted everything for you guys? <laughs> has it been harder? Do you like it online? Um, so, yeah. <sighs> Where do we begin? <laughs> So I guess it depends on like the level you are in your training. So us as MS3s entering our MS4 year, we were supposed to take step two. <laughs> that got pushed back multiple times. Um, so there's two parts to step two. So there's like CK, which is like the knowledge based one. And then there's CS, which is like in person and like you have um, standardized, patient. yeah, standardized patients. So that got completely canceled. And so we don't have to do that this year for us. So, and then you can also do away rotations, which is basically like an audition rotation in the specialty that you choose to kind of like show off and show your skills to a different program that may not be your home program. Typically it's in different states that got canceled. <laughs> so like a lot of things got canceled and postponed. Everything is like virtual now in terms of like lectures, which I like because I never really went to lecture during my first and second year, I always streamed anyway. So like it really didn't make a big difference. Um, but just in terms of like applying to residency, we were really impacted in that sense. But now looking back, like we get to save a lot of money for interviews using like, we get to do our interviews in the comfort of our own homes. We don't have to travel, pay for flights, pay for, you know, hotels and things like that. So we get to save a lot of money, but I mean, we were definitely impacted, but our school did a good job of like, you know, making accommodations and like keeping us up to date with things, and, like just still trying to give us the best education that we can have. like with the circumstances, so. Yeah. So I was in, just finished my first year of PhD and then now I'm in my second year. So like in March, everything shut down. We couldn't go into labs. So that was really hard knowing that I had all this research to do, not trying to be in my PhD for 10 years and can't do lab work. Um, but we were able to, I think in, May, I was able to start going in like very, very, basically it's like eased up to now I'm basically back full time from May. And also as you all probably saw in the news, Florida is not the most ideal, um, not ideally handling COVID. So <laughs> that is the whole separate issue that has added more complications. But in terms of like a research perspective, I think I'm pretty lucky that I was in my first year sex slash second year where I'm still figuring out my project. I'm not like, I need to graduate like really soon like it was it was fine all the classes went online I was able to try to learn some um, programming if anyone's registering for classes if you have programming skills any type of programming skills would recommend you learn some it's very helpful for research and really hard 
for me personally to learn. Um, so I was trying to like learn and read more into my um, research and whatnot. So try to use my time wisely, but it was definitely hard not being able to go in the lab because all my work is bench work. So it's not a lot of um, virtual things. Yeah, so we, when COVID started, I was still a second year towards the end of my second year. And it really, so it impacted us in like a good and bad way. The good way, good part was like, they were kind of just like, okay, we're done with classes. And I was like, great, I can study for boards now. <laughs> and I don't have to deal with going to, to like in-person classes, which wasn't super helpful to me anyways. Um, so in that sense, we had a little bit more time to study, but then we were really impacted by when we could take our boards. Like I was supposed to take them at, in May and I was actually signed up for step one and level one, which is both board exams for the DO and MD. And both of mine were pushed out for a month. And so it was like an extra month of dedicated, which is when we only study for boards, which is a really long time. Um, so in that sense, we were impacted, but I don't think we were as impacted as like the fourth years who are kind of having a little bit more trouble with um, finding rotations and such. But I think in a sense, the schools have been, like they said, the schools have been really good about helping the schools, helping their students adjust to this situation. Like, so a lot of medical schools will have one hospital that's associated with them. We actually have 17 different sites and we kind of spread out depending on where we want to go. So what we, a lot of our students are doing is instead, because a lot of away rotations aren't possible, they're able to do their away rotations at those sites, even if it's not specifically somewhere where they wanted to do. Um, so schools are pretty good about helping us adjust, even like the first and second years right now, it's a little bit unfortunate that they can't be in person and like meeting each other, but they're working, they're working, they're trying their best to get them to connect and be able to, you know, do their first and second year. Uh, thank you. I think we have a question in the chat. Uh, Evelina said, how did you all go about creating your medical school application list? What aspects of the schools were most important for you? Um, for me, the location was like top of the list. I didn't apply to any schools outside of Texas. Um, and I knew that I wanted to stay close to home. So I obviously location was very important. And then I looked at diversity. For me, I wanted to be in a population where one, I would see a lot of a diverse group of people, but then also be trained with a diverse group of people. Um, as well as faculty, I wanted to be able to see people who look like me, that would be teaching me. Um, and other than that, that was pretty much, I had a very simple <laughs> list. But those are the very like, knowing that, like knowing now what I would have known it would just been a lot of information about step one scores and pass rates and all that stuff. And luckily Texas had a lot of good programs. So I knew that I'll be trained well. So I just wanted to figure out like where I would be happiest and that was location-based. Yeah. yeah, I have to like go off of that. I pretty much the same reason. Like for me, as I said in the beginning, location was a really big deal for me. I really wanted to be as close as possible to my family because just some personal reasons that I needed to be nearby. Um, so that was a big, big, like really important for me, but also diversity was a huge deal. Like I, even if they didn't necessarily have a biggest diverse population of students, what were they doing about it and how are they working on it? You know, I think between my year and the year before you could see a clear difference in how much they were trying and recruiting diverse students. And like, that was, that was like super, super important to me because like this, said, you want to see people who look like you, but you also want to work next to people who look like you. And it's, it just shows you how much you're respected as a student. You know, I think it's, it just makes a big difference in your training. I think if you're just surrounded by people who look like you, I think a lot of times when, when you have a population of students that are just, just like white, like you're not going to you're not necessarily going to get what you need to out of your medical education because you you just like you just won't. <laughs> Building off on that question, what was the hardest part of getting into med school and what is the hardest part of med school now that you're in it? The MCAT was the most annoying part for me. I personally did not enjoy <laughs> studying for <laughs> boards or any type of type, I'm not really 
a great test taker. Um, and so that whole period was just like unnecessarily <laughs> stressful and draining and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would have to agree. Because I took the MCAT twice. So Same. I'm old, y'all. So I took like the old MCAT <laughs> before they changed it to the new one. And then like, because I wanted to go ahead and take the old one. Because like, I don't want to study for a whole new different MCAT. But then like, honestly, the new MCAT was um, even though it's longer, it was a lot easier for me. And so I ended up taking that. But honestly, just going through the process of having to study for that, that it tests two times and having to pay for the resources and like it's expensive and it's just draining and tiring. So I feel like that was probably the hardest part. Med school, honestly, same thing. Like I'm not a great test taker. So taking all these exams and these boards and like aiming for these goal scores and like comparing yourself to other people, like that's honestly been the worst part of medical school. Just because like in med school, like they make it easy easy for you to compare yourself like they post everybody's grades like you know everybody's scores you know like the averages and so it's like dang like I didn't even like hit that score today but mm -hmm. like honestly that's the I feel like that was like the hardest part of med school just the exams I have to agree strongly about all the standardized tests not my favorite um things um yeah studying for the MCAT was not fun the whole application process it is really stressful so while you're applying it's good to like keep in mind to like do some fun things schedule some things to look forward to because once you have the pressure of turning in your primary application and then the secondaries come in you're like oh my goodness I have to write like however many more applications this is nuts so yeah and then in medical school the standardized test I took step one last year I can't believe it was a year so step one those are the medical board certification um exams um for the MD program, and I know that I don't know exactly with you, but the, I know the DO programs are similar where they have like just step certification tests, which I didn't know what step one until I got to med school was. So it's okay if you, this is totally unfamiliar. Um, and just really quick to go back to the um, making your med school list. Um, for me, it was like a research focus. So that's, if you're interested in research, like that's something to definitely look for. I was looking for like a very collaborative research environment. Um, but also when you're making your list and like trying to fit yourself into these bubbles at little medical at, at medical schools, looking at GPA and test scores and all this stuff, just remember that everything is a range. So the scores they post of their average class of accepted students, it's an average. There's a range and there's a reason why they're taking people who have higher scores and lower scores. So don't exclude yourself from schools where you think, oh, well, this box isn't checked. So like, I shouldn't apply there. No, you should cast a wide net of something. If you're really interested in their program and like, you think you're a good fit, then even reaching out to the admissions office and being like, hi, like I submitted my application, but I'm concerned about this aspect. Like, is there anything I can do? So just being proactive about that and not, um, not excluding yourself from certain schools, because I'm sure everyone here super awesome and don't don't think just because oh I, i'm missing this by just a little bit or even a lot that it's totally out of the game because it's it's not yeah i think the hardest part about applying to med school is the mcat as everyone has said i think i don't think i learned how to really study for a standardized test until step one i'm not gonna lie it was just it felt like when I took the MCAT I didn't even know how to really really do it um, and I wish I kind of looked out to help looked out for help for that um, and then the hardest part of a med school I think is imposter syndrome like they said you're literally always comparing yourself to other people it's like oh my god that person knew the answer to that pimping question but I didn't know it and it's just it's that constant feeling but you have to really you really have to remind yourself that you're here for a reason you are accepted for a reason and even though you don't think it, people are proud of you for where you are and physicians see how hard you're working. And I also have friends that have applied, applied to medical school three times before they got in. Like just because you don't get in, if you don't get in the first time, it does not completely exclude you from medical school. But then you also consider like other pathways too. Like I think it's good to always keep your options open, but if you don't make it the first time, that's totally fine. That's like normal. So don't don't put too much pressure on yourself. Um, so my, does anyone else have any question before I ask another one? Oh, okay. So did you guys take any gap years? Why or why not? And what did you do then? Yeah, I took a gap year. Um, so I knew 
senior year, like junior year, when I took the MCAT the first time and I didn't do well, I was already on the fence about taking a gap year just because I wanted to rest. And then when I didn't get the score, the score that I wanted to the first time, I was like, okay, this is my sign that I really do need to take a break. So I ended up taking a year off after I graduated from undergrad and I just worked. Like I was like, let me just adult for a little bit, pay bills, live on my own, like experience life outside of college. Um, so I, I was like a research assistant. And so I did that for a year and I liked it. Like I got to have some fun, travel a little bit, just like chill and relax before entering into medical school. And I highly suggest it. It's not for everybody. It's a lot of people just want to go straight in. But if you do feel like you need a break, it's okay. Like I feel like it's becoming more common for people to take gap years, like not just one year, but years. So a lot of people do it. It's common. People in medical school are, are of all ages. So if you feel like you need that break, then definitely do it. If you want to like join the Peace Corps for two years, go do that. Like live your life before medical school. Cause honestly, like it's a huge commitment. And once you're in it, you're in it. So you want to make sure, you know, you do kind of everything you want to do yeah. before you get to that point. Um, but yeah. Yeah, for me, I didn't do a gap year, but I graduated in the fall. So I had six months until I started my, starting medical school. So it felt like a, a good of enough break for me. So I already knew that I was going to be graduating early. So that was pretty much how why I didn't choose a gap year. So as I mentioned, I took two years off to do research just to make sure that's what I really wanted to do. And also highly recommend it. Um, was really great and while being at Simmons you're really close to so many resources so many hospitals research institutes so really whatever you're interested in you can do and it doesn't have to be something medically related if you don't want it to be like just do whatever you want to do and also plug for research if you are interested in research just remember there's all different types of research there's clinical research or clinical research coordinators where you talk to patients or enroll people in studies versus bench research, which is what I do where you're like pipetting. So if you had a lab experience, you're like, wow, I really hate research. Don't say that because there's all different types of research. So um, it's a good way to like learn about a different field or like explore what area you might be interested in. And it comes in all different formats. So um, highly encourage gap years. Yeah, I took a gap year as well. I took one gap year and I was medical scribing in Boston for a little bit. Um, I definitely recommend just take, like if you feel like you need to take your off, take it off because like they said, once you're in med school, you're in it. <laughs> like Taking that year off to just work and not be studying the way you have to for med school it was like, it makes a big difference on your mental health. I also personally was a little bit younger for my age. So I was very okay with taking in the year off. Like I'm still 24. So it's, I'm a little bit on the younger side, so it was okay for me to take a year off. And I think from this is something what I've heard from peers as well. It's like they felt like when they were applying straight out, of like during their junior year, they were interviewing next to like people who, when the average is just 25, and a lot of times people were saying this person's too young compared to these other people. So they do look at that a little bit, but don't like, don't stop yourself from applying just because of that. Um, I just I do think there was a benefit of a gap year because I just felt like I was able to grow a little bit, see the clinical world for a bit, see what I was like really getting myself into, um, take a second to decide if this is what I really want to do. And also just to go off of that, I had no time in undergrad to even think about applying. I was just not as organized. I was having fun doing my extracurriculars. I was like, I really don't want to apply right now. So I didn't, and I have to say it was a really good decision. So would you guys change anything um, in your journey to medical school? I think I would have taken care of my mental health a little bit better in my pre-med years. I feel like there were times that I was overloading myself with a lot and specifically those time I wish I was just a little bit focused on myself and not trying to do everything and like not trying to just check off the boxes like I had said earlier I think there were definitely like I think my sophomore year that I was just taking way too many hard classes at once and I wish I had just like thought about the plan a little bit further and like spread it out so I wasn't like killing myself to get to where I am now. Um, 
Um, I'm not a person who like, who likes to be like, oh, I wish I would have did this, I wish I would have did that. Um, I guess looking back on it, developing stronger study habits would have helped me immensely <laughs> in undergrad, um, just like making things a little bit easier in medical school. But I feel like me struggling during medical school has just like added to my journey and made me the person that I am today and like the future physician that I'm going to be. So I don't like regret that. But I mean, if you have the option now to like really figure out how best you study and like what resources work for you and things like that, then I'll be a good thing to look at. But I mean, your journey is your journey and what's going to happen is going to happen. So yeah. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't have had the drive that I had today had I not struggled a little bit um because I don't think I would have wanted it as much if it came really really easy for me and so through the struggles and like through the harder times I found myself like becoming more self-sufficient in a sense mm -hmm. and like being able to be comfortable reaching out for help and finding mentors in that way nothing really came easy so it wasn't like I don't know I wouldn't have done it any differently because I felt like I wouldn't have had the opportunities and met the people that I met if I hadn't gone through what I went through just definitely I think, yeah, it's hard to look back and like, oh, what would I have changed? But I think um, for me, like networking isn't something that comes very easy. So um, maybe networking with more people, professors, getting to know more people. And also, um, again, hindsight as 2020, but um, identifying, like figuring out how to identify like really positive mentors. I think that a mentor is someone who you can go back to throughout your whole career. So being able to like identify and have that, build that strong support network, which can be undergrad professors, it can be people from your extracurriculars, like just developing strong relationships with people because that can only help you later on. Thank you. Um, so how do you guys, what are some challenges that you face being in a white male dominated field each of you are in? So I would say it's hard right now I'm trying to come up with my PhD committee and I currently can I've only found like one woman who is going to be on my committee because the I would say Miami is working towards creating a more um, diverse uh, faculty, but it's a work in progress. So I think it's hard but identifying those mentors early on is super important. Yeah, for me, uh, going into anesthesia, I'm literally going to be like, what, 2% of anesthesiologists are Black women. And I mean, honestly, like, what, first year of med school, there was someone that spoke to us on a panel or did a talk with us. And she was like, your mentor does not have to be, that doesn't have to look like you. You just have to find people who are willing to help you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you will grow with people who, yeah, I might exactly. have a mentor who's a white man, and he probably has not the same experiences as, as I do, but he has resources. And that's really what's gonna keep you, or that's what's really gonna elevate you in your career. Not just like, um, what's it called? Keeping yourself constricted to what you feel like is best for you. Cause God has a way of showing you like what he's ready for you to experience when he's ready for that. And so I feel like just being open to knowing that you're not gonna be in a field that is necessarily always gonna be supportive. I don't think once you get through med school, you're not as naive. <laughs> as you were when you were pre-med. And so you know that things are not gonna be all hunky-dory and rainbows and butterflies. Like it's it's politics when you get into med when you get into medicine. And so you really have to one find your voice and be confident in it. Like when you say something, stand 10 toes down in that and really be confident and you know not waver on that because people will see you for that and you will be more respected um, when you're able to speak up for yourself. Because of course there's going to be times where like you say something and then the white guy he's, who says it gets more acknowledgement or is like oh yeah I didn't think about that I mean like you just said it but like you'll get you know dismissed on things like that so you have to be confident in yourself like she said you have to speak up um and then of course like microaggressions are real um like there's daily challenges that you go through but I mean you pick your your battles and you just have to like know your worth and know that you're supposed to be there and just keep going and yeah yeah, I agree with what everyone has said. I think a lot of times I'm walking into places as like this five foot little woman and people see that people will see me as that, that little, like people have 
will not know my name and will be like, oh yeah, that Indian med student, you know, and that will, that has happened to me and I know will continue to happen to me. But I think you just have to advocate for yourself, you know, like advocate that you are a medical student, you have worked this hard to be here and you're here to learn. And although it's sometimes difficult to advocate for yourself instead of in, in front of like that male surgeon, but you just have to be like, I'm here to learn and I'm not going to leave without learning what I need to learn. And it is, it's easier said than done, but the more you're just there and in everyone's faces, people are going to teach you and it's difficult, but you'll be able to do it. And I think that just comes with time. It's like, for example, this year for my third year of rotations, I started with OBGYN and that was a field that I really had to advocate for myself. Um, a lot of times people are tired and don't want to teach you, um, especially because it's a field where a lot of physicians know that you don't want, like a lot of these students don't even want to go into this. But I was like, you know what? I know nothing about this field. I don't know if I want, if I'm even, even interested or not, but I'm, so I'm going to be here and I'm going to learn from it. And even if you, like, you're going to put me down by being like, oh, like, you don't want, you don't really want to do this, or you're just here as a student just because you have to, I'm going to be here and you're going to have to teach me. Thank you. Uh, my next question is, well, a student just typed this question in, how do you prevent burnout? I think like we talked about self-care, self-care is super important. Take care of yourself, find what you like to do, find your support system, um, and just really know when you're reaching your limit or way before that, <laughs> reach out and ask for help. I think a lot of like the Office of Student Services, like they have at Simmons, um, they're there for you. They can connect you with the resources you need. So just know that like the resources are there. I think that schools are becoming way more aware of burnout. And we've had, I think we've had like a few lectures on burnout and how to prevent burnout, et cetera. So um, just being try is hard, but trying to be self-aware and reaching out when you need help. Yeah, look for your support system, as we've been saying, you know, you have these people who care about you and don't be afraid to reach out to them. You'd be surprised how many people are going through the same thing that you're going through. Okay, so one last question that I have that someone else typed in is specifically for the Simmons alum, how has Simmons helped you um, with your journey to medical school or what classes or extracurriculars, anything, um, what aspect of Simmons has helped? I think I was able to learn really well in the Simmons environment because it was small, close-knit, like I really got a hands-on like learning experience with my professors, like I was able to go and talk to people all the time. So I think having that strong support system um, has really helped me and is something that I really enjoyed about Simmons. And also I felt like I was able to be involved in all sorts of different extracurriculars. Um, I didn't feel like I was getting lost in a big school, which is one reason why I picked an MD PhD program because it's a cohort of like smaller group of students in a bigger medical school um, population. So I think I was gravitating for that little smaller security blanket within a bigger um, within a bigger group. Yeah, I really I think the community at Simmons really helped me get to where I am today. It's like being in a small small classes. Like I remember taking developmental bio with like eight people next to me in like a tiny room and it was being so connected to the professors there like they were able to write such a strong letter of recommendation because they knew you so well you weren't one of 400 kids so I think you get to know your professors a lot better you're in the middle like you're right next to Longwood you get these connections that I don't think I would have been able to get somewhere else, somewhere else. Um, and the other thing is it's like I just, I, every time I think about Simmons, I'm like, okay, this is like this badass school with like these empowered women and everyone is encouraging you to do what you want to do. Like no, I felt like no professor ever was like, oh, you can't get into medical school because of your sports. You can't get into medical school because you're a woman. Like everyone was encouraging you to do what you wanted to do regardless of what that was. Thank you. That's all the questions I had. Did anyone else have any questions they'd like to ask? No? 
All right, then. Thank you guys for all. Thank you all for answering the questions. I know I had a lot on my list, um, but I really appreciated um, you guys taking time out of your busy, busy schedules to talk with us and give us some gem gems, dropping gems here and there. So thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for having us. I love coming back and doing Simmons related things. So anytime you guys need anything. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. If y'all have any other questions, like things that you're too afraid to ask now, <laughs> if you want to just like email us or DM us, like we're open to any questions, giving you any advice, yeah. or whatever you may need, just reach out and we'll be happy to help. For sure. Yeah, thank you for having us. And you guys um, have our email address. So just reach out anytime you guys have any questions. Uh, let me stop the recording.